Welcome everyone to the second the Chicago University FGV Forum in Law and Economics. In these difficult times, we wish you all are well and safe. My name is Rodrigo Viana, and I'm the head of the International Affairs Office at Getulio Vargas Foundation Law School in Rio de Janeiro. It's a pleasure to have you all here for the year of deck lectures in the next four weeks, when we will approach important topics under the law and economics perspective. This forum had its first edition last year, and it's already a successful reality that for sure we will continue for the coming years. Each week, we will have a professor from the Chicago University Law School, followed by a FTV faculty member from the law schools of Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo, discussing hot topics with the audience. Before I give the word to my colleagues, Maria Lucia and Omri Bentaha, I would like to stress that all statements expressed by Fundação Getúlio Vargas employees and guests in our online events and broadcasts exclusively represent their opinions and not necessarily FGV's institutional position. We also reiterate that everyone present here agreed to participate in this event of their own free will, and they will consent to be recorded in this broadcast, which will be posted later on FGV's official channels. It's truly an honor to be part of this important joint initiative among, among Chicago Law School, FGV Direito Rio, and FGV Sao Paulo. This said, my deepest acknowledgments to Professor Omri for all support and partnership for making this possible together with my friend, Maria Lucia. Please, Maria Lucia, your first words. Okay. Thank you very much, Rodrigo. Good afternoon, dear colleagues, dear participants. As Associate Dean of FGV Direito São Paulo, I would like to say that's a great pleasure to have you all congregate here to start the second the University of Chicago FGV Direito Rio and Sao Paulo Forum in Law and Economics in Brazil. I must, uh, and it's important to, to remind you that carrying out our planning during this difficult time is a proof of uh, the resilience, imagination, and determination of this special group of colleagues. The goal uh, of the forum is to discuss the most up-to-date law and economics hot topics, as Rodrigo mentioned before. So this year's four-week program will address uh, the following themes. Economic analysis of climate change regulation, empirical research in law and economics, law and the, pandem and the pandemic uh, and economic analysis, uh, and economic analysis of contract law. I would like to express thanks in particular to Omri ben from the University of Chicago Law School and Rodrigo from FGV Direito Rio. Our special thanks to the professors as David Wiesbark, Damika da Marpala, Daniel Hamel, and Lisa Burstein for the University of Chicago, and Romulo Sampaio, Bruno Salama, Luciano Tim and Mariana Pragenda from FGV, who embraced this project uh, with great enthusiasm and gener generosity. Uh, we are grateful to our technical team that has worked hard, as usual, to make this project feasible. Needless to say, but it is too important to stress that uh, we had a great institutional support from both the University of Chicago and the Fundação Getúlio Vargas. We are extremely grateful to everyone who helped to make this project happen. Finally, I hope you enjoy this fantastic opportunity and I do hope that the future third edition of the Chicago FGV Forum in Law and Economics in Brazil will be in Brazil, uh, will be face to face. And thanks to uh, all, and I would like to please ask from our colleague Omri to uh, present our professor, uh, David Winsbach. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Maria Lucia and uh, Rodrigo. Uh, thank you for collaborating with us and joining this vision of trying to make 
law and economics more influential and more helpful in thinking about current problems of, of social policy, both in Brazil and Latin America, as well as in the United States and more generally. And when we launched the program last year, I have to say I was very impressed with how the FGV schools were able to broadcast these lectures to such very large audiences, both live audiences that are now attending on Zoom and on YouTube, as well as those who later on watch these lectures. Um, and I think that this is very, very encouraging to us in Chicago that there is such great interest and such appetite for using economics and social science in thinking about legal policy and trying to check, to know, to learn what does the data say? What do the social sciences have to say when we are trying to solve or to suggest new solutions and to test the validity of old solutions to our a, a new social problems? Um, and so thank you again to our to to Maria Lucien and Rodrigo for for this uh, um, initiative and for such excellent organization. Um, I'm also incredibly grateful to four of my colleagues who will participate and have put forth original new lectures on topics of great interest, lectures that would be appealing both to an introductory audience who know very little about the topics, as well as to experts. And I can't be more thrilled than to launch this uh, series of lectures with the lecture by my esteemed colleague, David Weisbach. David, Professor Weisbach is perhaps the leading authority in the United States on the on tax law and tax, tax policy in general, has written the most important articles on this issue in the 20 plus years that I've been reading his work. Um, and, uh, but if that's not enough, it's at some point in his career, when problems of climate change began, became more nagging and more moved to the front of our social agenda, Professor Weisbach has become, without doubt, the most influential and serious scholar in law schools in America, studying the issues of climate change and their regulation. His work is critical to understand how to realistically address climate change, what the costs are of failing to act and what kind of legal thinking as well as social science methods need to be put to the fore in order to address these uh, issues. So with no, without further ado, I will mute myself and give the podium to Professor Weisbach. Hey, thank you very much, Omri. I hope I can uh, stand up to that generous introduction and thank you for having me uh, today. Um, so I'm going to talk about the law and economics of climate change. And I thought maybe I'd start with just a few pictures that you've probably seen already. So you've probably seen a picture that looks like this. This is um, the global average temperature change uh, relative to pre-industrial temperatures. So the zero degree C line there is the average temperatures that were existed pre-industrial. As you can see, temperatures have been going up quite dramatically over the last 30, 40, or 50 years. You've probably all seen graphs that look just like this. And you've probably seen pictures that look like this. And what this is in the top row there is the global dispersion of those temperature changes, right? The figure I just showed you was the global average, but not every place in the world will equal will be at the average. And this picture here, these maps show you how those temperature changes affect different parts of the world. And the top row shows you one degree uh, degree uh, increase in temperature, which we've seen about already. And the bottom row are projections for what we would see if we saw one and a half degree C increase, two degree Cs, and then God forbid, four degree Cs. One thing to notice about this is there's a lot of dispersion. Different parts of the world see different kinds of temperature increases. Um, climate change is one of the world's biggest problems and, and looking at figures like this can seem daunting It's how can we address this. Uh, researching the area can also seem daunting because there's literally tens of thousands of people already working in the area. Um, the recent IPCC report, which came out I guess earlier this month, 
was 4,000 dense pages uh, with sites to literally thousands of papers. And so a question is, how can law and economic scholars engage with this research and engage with a problem of this scope? And what I want to suggest to you is that notwithstanding the enormous amount of work and global effort on the problem, that there are important opportunities for scholars in law and economics to make progress and to help understand the problem and how to, to address it. Right? There are many things that we don't understand today that fall directly in the scope of what law and economic scholars do. So I've got a kind of a two-part agenda to the talk. Um, the first is what I want to do is review some of the latest findings from the IPCC and give you some background uh, on climate change that we need to understand in order to think about what problems we need to address. And then for the rest of my time, what I want to do is go through a bunch of different problems, just kind of highlighting them and talking about the issues that law and economic scholars might uh, address or might contribute to. The goal being to have inspire you all to work on this problem, to think about different things you can contribute. All right, so climate change basics. I'm going to talk about four issues in climate change that you should have kind of in your, in your quiver, if you will, uh, to think about uh, the legal problems. There's many, many more we could talk about, but I think these four you need to have kind of always right there when you're thinking about climate change. These are emissions that is what's causing climate change, this concept of a carbon budget, how we think about uncertainty. Is a, uncertainty is a key feature of this problem. And then finally, what does it take to address the problem? What are the emissions reductions pathways that we are looking at? Okay, so emissions. Uh, the most important greenhouse gas, so GHG greenhouse gas is carbon dioxide. Right. There are a bunch of other greenhouse gases. There's methane, nitrous oxide, a bunch of smaller gases called hydrofluorocarbons and chlorofluorocarbons and so forth. Um, but the most important greenhouse gas when we think about stopping climate change is carbon dioxide. Most carbon dioxide comes from burning fossil fuels to produce energy. Right? There's some emissions from deforestation, uh, particularly in Brazil and Indonesia and Malaysia. Um, but most carbon dioxide globally comes from burning fossil fuels, right? which means we put that together, that we should think about climate change primarily as an energy problem. Right? If you're studying climate change, you're necessarily studying energy. So here's some figures to let you see how that works. This, oops, I'm sorry. This is the um, total sum of greenhouse gases emitted in, I think, 2019, uh, broken down by different gases. Right. You can see by this measure, and there are alternative measures about how to put this together, but by this measure, 75% or so of global emissions are from carbon dioxide. Methane is the second largest gas. Most of that is also related to energy. And then other gases are much smaller contributors. So when we think about climate change, we should be thinking about carbon dioxide, and most of that comes from energy. Oops. Okay, what are our sources of energy? This is global energy, so all the energy in the world in, I think, 2019. And as you can see, almost all energy, 84%, 84.3% of energy comes from the three fossil fuels, oil, coal, and natural gas. We can see all the way there, over there on the right-hand side, the green and the yellow, those are wind and solar, 2.2% and 1.1%. They're kind of currently negligible sources of energy. Right, that is most energy still today comes from the fossil fuels. This is the same data, but broken down by year. Right, what this lets you see is the growth of fossil fuel use from 1800, so basically the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, to today. Right, the bottom kind of red line there is biomass that stayed kind of constant over time, but as you can see, global energy use has gone up exponentially. Uh, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, right? Coal comes in first. So in the early part of the Industrial Revolution, it was all coal. Then around the turn of the last century, we start bringing in oil. And then finally, the most recent uh, fossil fuel is gas. And gas is now becoming dominant in the United States, for example. You can see the other uh, sources of energy in there, nuclear, hydropower, and wind, again, all relatively negligible, even to today. Right. One thing you note on the coal line, if you look at that gray line, um, coal use has been relatively flat for the past five to 10 years. It's gone down a lot in the United States, 
but that's been offset by an increase in coal in China and other countries. And this breaks the same data down by region. So instead of by type of uh, fuel, it's who's doing the emitting. And we'll come back to this at the end of my talk, talk about some of the issues as to who's doing the emitting, but you can see early on, it was the EU and the United States as the primary emitters, right? If you look around, you know, 19, draw that line in there, 1980 or so, China and uh, most of Asia and India are relatively negligible. And you can see in recent years and the growth in emissions from China. And China is now the, the dominant global emitter. Right, we'll come back to um, uh, why this matters towards the end of my talk. Okay, so that's number one. We should think about uh, climate change as an energy problem. Then we should think about energy. It's coming from those three fossil fuels. And the question is how we deal with that. Concept number two, which is important to keep in mind, which has recently been heavily incorporated into the IPCC reports is this notion of the carbon budget, right? Here's the idea of a carbon budget. Temperatures will continue to go up as long as the stock of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere goes up, right? That is, so long as we're emitting greenhouse gases, we continue to warm, there's no end to it. So to stop climate change, right, to stop temperature increases, that means we must have net zero emissions, right? That is the ultimate goal of climate policy is to have zero carbon dioxide and other emissions. Now, one thing that's kind of nice about the carbon budget is that there's a roughly linear relationship between the total sum of CO2 emissions in the past, just add them up, don't discount, don't adjust them, just add them up. There's a linear relationship between that and what's called the transient climate response, which is kind of very quick, you know, within 10, 50 or 100 year climate response. And roughly 1 trillion tons of carbon, not carbon dioxide, but carbon translates to about two degrees of warming. So this is from the most recent IPCC, whoops, I'm sorry, most recent IPCC report. And this is their picture, their graph of the carbon budget. And uh, the squiggly line on the left-hand side is past emissions. And, uh, and temperature change. I'm sorry, it's past temperature change, right? Yeah, it's past emissions on the x-axis and temperature change on the y-axis. That's cumulative emissions. And then the colored lines, this kind of straight lines to the right are projections. And they use five different scenarios, those different colored projections, SSP 1.9 and so forth to 8.5. Those are projections. Talk about them a little bit more in a minute of different emission scenarios. What you can see is that the greater the emissions, right, as we move to the right on the x-axis, the greater temperature change in a roughly linear fashion. This, by the way, is the IPCC's estimate of what remains of our carbon budget. So suppose we want to keep global temperatures at two degrees C. That's what the Paris Agreement uh, agrees to. And the Paris Agreement says we, we want to try and keep them at one to one and a half degrees C. We've already emitted something like, what's that say, 2,560 gigatons of carbon dioxide historically. And if you want to keep temperatures below, say, two degrees C, so we've got a total budget that will keep us below two degrees C, what we can see is we've got another 1,150 to go. Right. And if we want to keep emissions, I'm sorry, temperature change below one and a half degrees C, we only have about 400 gigatons left to go. But we've emitted most of what we're gonna be allowed to emit if you wanna keep temperatures below one and a half degrees C and about two thirds of what you can emit, you wanna keep temperatures below two, two degrees C. Right. By the way, I don't have this for you, but if we project based on current emissions, when we hit the two degrees C benchmark based on the carbon budget, I pick a number, guess what that is? The number is roughly in the mid 2030s. So 10 to 15 years or so is when we kind of run out of our carbon budget. And at that point, if you want to keep temperatures below two degrees C, we have to stop emitting altogether. Okay, that's point number two is this idea of a carbon budget and a fixed amount that we can emit. 
Point number three that you should always keep in mind when thinking about climate change is uncertainty, right? Notwithstanding the thousands of researchers that are working on the problem, there's just a huge amount we don't know. Some of it's impossible to know, like what future emissions are gonna be, but some of them are just things that are just too hard to figure out. So for example, even if we knew future emissions, we don't really know what the effect those emissions will, ha emissions will have on the climate. We don't know whether there are tipping points. At what point do things kind of go kablooey and we can't return back to where we were before? And if there are tipping points, we don't know where they are and when we'll trip them, right? We don't know to what extent climate change will hurt people or hurt animals, right? That is, we have really no sense of what the harms will be. And we don't know what technologies or solutions we will have to solve climate change, right? There's just a huge amount we don't know. So when you're, when you're working in climate change, one of the hard things about the problem, one of the key things to always keep in mind is you're always working in a problem where you just don't know the answers, where there's gonna be an amount of deep uncertainty. And so decision-making or recommendations for policymakers are always in the context of how do you decide when you don't know? And that's a little bit unusual for a legal problem. Mostly when we think about legal problems in law and economics, we don't assume we don't know the answer. We assume we can make some reasonable computations and estimates and so forth. And it's not necessarily the case in climate change. Here's some pictures that will show you that. So this is the same carbon budget picture I showed you a minute ago. And I wanna focus on a different aspect of it. So notice that the, the part to the right, the straight lines, have those kind of spread out colored you know, blotches, if you will. And what are those? The spread, if you read across to the y-axis, is the possibly different temperature changes we'll see for any given amount of emissions. So if you go to the 3000 gigaton mark, kind of that vertical line there and read up, you can see that then the spread, possible temperature change that we'll see with 3000 gigatons might be anywhere from two degrees to one degree. Right? And that's enormously different in terms of global impacts. Right? As we go out further to the right, if we go to 4,500 gigatons, you can see again, the spread is well over one and a half degrees. Right? So there's enormous uncertainty just in something like the carbon budget not to speak of how that affects humans. And so the problem is, is one of deep uncertainty. Here's another picture of uncertainty. Um, this is something called the equilibrium climate sensitivity. So this is the uh, temperature change we expect to see once everything kind of settles down. So if we emit say 3000 gigatons of carbon or carbon dioxide, um, and we wait a few hundred or a few thousand years and temperatures stabilize, what will be the temperature range, the temperature increase at that point. And the, the box to the left there, if you tilt your head, is kind of a PDF, right? A probability distribution function of possible temperature changes given uh, a certain amount of emissions, of emissions, right? So for the same amount of emissions, we might expect that to be about three degrees C temperature increase, but it could be as high as six degrees or as low as one. Right? We really don't know. And the difference between six and one is the difference between humanity surviving and not. Right? So this is kind of this enormous problem of uncertainty uh, that we have to deal with. And that graph there, that left-hand figure, is slightly narrower in the most recent IPCC report than it has been for the past 40 or 50 years, but it's essentially narrowed almost not at all until very recently since you know, the 1950s we have been unable to reduce the amount of uncertainty in our climate predictions. Okay, whoops, I'm sorry. Last point I wanna make, sorry, there we go, is what's it gonna to take to stop climate change? Right? That is, what do we think about when we think about emissions reductions, right? So the key point here is that energy systems, climate change is an energy problem, that energy systems are central to how modern economies work, right? That is, we can think of the entire economy globally or in, in any country you want as simply a way of transforming energy into useful things. Right? Energy is so pervasive, it's so reliable and so common, it's like oxygen. You don't even notice it's there, but it's, it's kind of vital to life. Everything that we have is driven by energy. In addition, energy systems are really large, really complex and they're made up of 
durable assets. So a recent estimate that I'm working on with a co-author is that the United States has durable energy assets of about $8 trillion. That's consists of refineries, pipelines, power plants, and other kind of big things that have long lives. In addition, we have 250 million vehicles in the, in the United States, home and commercial heating units and so forth. There's an enormous number of assets, fixed things, kind of big things, pipes and stuff like that, that are used to generate energy. And so thinking about reducing energy means kind of switching all of that stuff, all of those pipes and tankers and machines and all those kinds of things. To give you a sense of this, here's a picture. This is data from the World Bank that I grabbed. On the x-axis is GDP per capita log, GDP per capita, I should say. And on the y-axis is a, a measure of energy use per person, uh, kilograms of oil equivalent. So it's just a measure of energy use per person. And this is every country in the world. And what you can see is that the log of GDP per capita and the log of energy use per capita is almost linear. Right? That is, if we get richer, we use more energy. And there are no exceptions to this. There's no country in the bottom right that is wealthy and yet doesn't use a lot of energy. If we think that it's impossible to be in the bottom right, I think that's probably the case, then we can think about climate change as trying, or solving climate change, as trying to find a way to generate the energy needed to be in the top right. We want everyone to be wealthy and yet not causing emissions. Right, that's kind of the core problem with climate change. All right, now, how do we do that? The IPCC put together a bunch of scenarios. These are hypothetical future worlds. And these are the same ones I showed you with the carbon budget. And they have five of them in this graph. Uh, SP 8.5 is the top one where we simply do not reduce emissions at all, or not for a very long time. The very bottom one, SSP 1.9, is where we reduce the emissions quite rapidly. And these are kind of different scenarios that we might face in the future. The only ones that really reduce climate change at all are those bottom two, SSP 2.6 um, and SSP uh, 1.9. Right, if we wanna reduce or stop climate change, we kind of need to be in one of those bottom trajectories. Now, how do we do that? These are um, not, scenarios that are designed to optimize reaching some emissions goal. These are just kind of future histories, or if you will, science fiction, what might the future look like? The IPCC has also done kind of optimization exercises where they say, what is the emissions reductions path that we need to stay under a given temperature? They look like this. These are from a report from about two years ago, the IPCC did on uh, staying under one and a half degrees. So not the report that just came out a few weeks ago. And in this report, they asked a whole bunch of different modeling groups to do computational modeling of what the optimal pathways would be, emissions reductions pathway, that is the least cost pathway to keep global temperatures under one and a half degrees. And these lines there are just different modeling group scenarios that give us those temperature, that keep us under that temperature change. As you can see, then what we need is very, very rapid emissions reductions in order to stay under kind of reasonable temperature goals. Now, I left off the bottom of this graph. I'm gonna show you the bottom of this figure now. That's, what, that's right here. So what they did, I'm gonna go back a slide. Is they picked out of these, whoops, sorry. These lines, they picked out four of those lines. There's, I don't know if you can see it, there's maybe a hundred lines on that graph. They picked out four of them and highlighted them. Those are these four, they call them P1, 2, 3, and 4. And look at the middle one, let's say P2 or P3. What you can see there is the emissions reductions, that's the green line, are fairly rapid. That is, do we go up for a little bit in the future, we have a few years of possible temp of emissions increase, then we have to reduce emissions quite rapidly. And the thing to notice about these lines, and I'll come back to it later in my talk, is that they go below zero, right? That is all these projections, even P1, which is the most rapid emissions reductions, project that to stay under one and a half degrees, we need to have not just zero emissions, but negative emissions. The reason why is because our emissions now are so high, we have so much built-in climate change, if you will, that eventually we have to start drawing down emissions from the atmosphere and storing them in the ground. 
right? That's the only solution we really have right now for climate change. Okay, so that's my background on, on what we need to know. I wanna now just talk about a whole bunch of problems that maybe you might work on or that other law and economic scholars might work on, hopefully with the idea of inspiring future work on climate change. Okay, so here's some research topics. This is a pretty long list. I'm not gonna talk about them all. I'll just kind of mention a few of them, but just to go through them real quickly, what, what's up there. Um, instrument choice and instrument design. This is should we have a tax system or a cap and trade system or regulations or how should we mix those different things? And how do, if we're gonna do that, how do you design those systems? Been a lot of work on this already. We know a lot about it. There's some room for more work, but it's an area where we, I think, have a pretty good understanding of the trade-offs there. Discount rates. This is the problem of how we deal with people that are going to live in the distant future. One of the facts about climate change, which maybe I should have mentioned but didn't, is that carbon dioxide is incredibly, incredibly persistent in the atmosphere. So when we emit things today, the carbon dioxide that we emit, I'm sorry, when we produce burn fossil fuel today, the carbon dioxide that we emit will be in the atmosphere for 10,000 or maybe 100,000 years, right? That is, we are affecting the temperature in the long distant future. And the discount rate problem is how we think about people that are going to be living in the future and how our actions today affect those people and how we evaluate that, those harms. Another issue um, is projected harms, right? That is, if we have a temperature increase of two, three, four degrees, Celsius, what will happen? There's a lot of work on that already. We don't understand it very well, but it is perhaps also not the best thing for law and economics scholars to study. It's not really in our core expertise. The bottom set of topics, I'm gonna to talk about some of these in more detail are things we know, or things that maybe law and economics scholars have more ability to contribute to. These are uncertainty. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about uncertainty in the context of what's called the social cost of carbon. Um, trade and leakage, how we think about um, climate solutions when only parts of the world participate in those solutions, negative emissions and how we design systems for those, climate finance, um, which is how we deal with the interactions of climate change in the finance system, ethics and responsibility are a big piece of climate change and how we think about our obligations to other people, given that we're emitting uh, greenhouse gases, regulatory design, climate torts, all these issues are important ones. I'm only gonna talk about the first few. Yeah. All right, social cost of carbon. So if we do regulations, at least in the United States, where regulatory agencies are required to engage in cost benefit analysis and to publish their cost benefit analysis, publish their analysis uh, so people can see it. And if a regulation affects emissions of carbon dioxide or another greenhouse gas, the question is how do those changes in emissions, whether it's an increase or a decrease, enter into cost benefit analysis? What we need to know is what the incremental costs are from climate change due to a regulation when the regulation changes carbon dioxide emissions. All right, so the equation in the middle there is kind of a version of that. What that says is that we want to know the um, consumption or some other measure of well-being. I'm just using consumption here, so that's C. If we didn't have the regulation, so this BAU, business as usual, and we want to know what the consumption will be if we have the regulation, so it's C reg. And the difference then is gonna be, we wanna know what difference is due to climate change. And because emissions are persistent, they survive tens, hundreds, thousands of years in the atmosphere, we have to add that up over time. So what we've done is take the difference in consumption without the regulation and with the regulation at each time period T, and we just take the present value of that and we add it all up and that is known as the social cost of carbon. It's how much different or how much different welfare will be or how much different consumption will be present discounted value over time because of the change in emissions. But that's the social cost of carbon. Often it's defined as marginal, right? So rather than with and without the regulation, and we think of it as just one more pulse or unit of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So it would be C 
pulse and see without the pulse. Um, here, I'm just using regulations. And that's the concept of social cost of carbon. And that's what we in the United States use for cost benefit analysis in climate change. Now, the formula is relatively simple, but think about what goes into that formula. And here's kind of the assumptions we need. You know, to calculate that, we need a model of the economy. That is, we need to know what consumption is going to be under the business as usual scenario over hundreds of years. So that includes a model of the energy intensity of the economy. So we know what the emissions would be under the business as usual scenario, which means we have to predict energy technology for hundreds of years in the future. We then have to take those emissions and plug them into a climate model that tells us what the change in atmospheric temperatures will be given those emissions. And as I showed you a few minutes ago, there's enormous uncertainty in those climate models. We just don't really know. We take the output of that climate model, and then we have to figure out what the effects are of those temperature changes on people. That is, what change in consumption do we have? What other harms do we have because of those temperature changes? And then given those changes in consumption, we have to somehow figure out how much worse off people are because of that. We have to have figure out what the discounting is going to be and whether we're going to have some kind of marginal declining utility of income or something like that. We need some kind of curvature of the utility function to feed into that. Right? Every one of those four items is heroic. Right? They all have to be done over hundreds of years and added up over time. That's essentially impossible. And here's what the United States does to calculate this. We took three relatively simple models of the economy. These are kind of standard models you can pick up from economics of growth, kind of real simple stuff from say the 1950s. And we tune those three models to all have the same economic trajectory. So if we take an external economic trajectory that we're going to give those models and we tune them to do that. And then we staple onto those models a climate kind of subunit that tells us, given that economy, what the temperature change is going to be. And then we tack on top of that a damage function. It tells us, given those temperature changes, what the harms will be. Okay. Then we run each model under the business as usual. And we run them uh, one more time with either one more ton or with the emissions from that regulation. And we take the difference in consumption in each period, take the present value, add it all up, and we get a, a number for each model run. And what we do is we run those models thousands of times, sampling over different possible parameters, so climate sensitivities and discount rates and harm and so forth. And we kind of run them and get thousands and thousands of model runs and pick some kind of central value from those model runs. That's the process we use for the United States. And here's an example of the output of those processes. It looks like kind of a log normal function uh, with different possible social costs of carbon. And then these numbers, or some number from this log normal distribution is fed into uh, um, cost benefit analysis. All right, this is an example. This is from the Obama era clean power plan. And what you can see is they have um, there the monetized benefits and costs of changes in CO2 emissions from the clean power plan. And if you kind of look at the 2030 number, so that's the column on the right, and you read down, you see 6.4 billion or 20 billion. Those are different discount rates. Possible benefits from changes in emissions due to the clean power plan run through that model. And that's the kind of way this is used. All right, this has been done, a lot of work on it. What are the questions for law and economic scholars here? There's a lot of modeling work to be done. How do we think about the economy and what kind of climate module we tack onto the economics model and so forth. Uh, there's work estimating parameters, particularly harm and so forth. It's probably not the best use of law and economic scholars time but it's not really our comparative advantage. But the bottom is four questions that really are things we can be thinking about. First one is, is this a reasonable approach? But we need some value to use for regulatory purposes, want some value of climate change. 
but is this the right way to do it? Or are there other ways? Some people have suggested a cost effectiveness idea, which is figure out, you know, set a temperature target, say two degrees and figure out what the cost is of keeping us under that and use that kind of cost for regulatory purposes. Another question is, let's suppose we adopt this approach, the social cost of carbon approach, how should regulatory processes deal with massive uncertainty? But if I go back to this slide, and you're the regulator, how do you deal with this kind of information, this kind of differences in possible outputs? And in particular, what numbers should you use for cost benefit analysis? And then how should you communicate that to the public? Should you run some high numbers and some low numbers and communicate both or pick a central value? Figure out how to use that kind of uncertainty or deal with that kind of uncertainty in uh, an input to cost benefit analysis is an important problem for law and economic scholars. The discount rate can be really important. Let me show you again, I'm gonna go up one slide. This is from the clean power plan. You can see with a 5% discount rate, looking at the 2030 line, the benefits from the clean power plan, power plan were 6.4 billion. With a 3% discount rate, they're 20 billion, right? Three and a half times as big or three times as big just by changing the discount rate a little bit. Now there's a huge, huge amount of scholarship on discount rates, literally thousands of articles on it. But the question might be, does the use of discount rates in this particular kind of regulatory process, I'm sorry, does this type of regulatory process change how we think about discount rates? And finally, and this is I think really hard, the procedure I just described to you uses global harm. So the United States in using the social cost of carbon and cost benefit analysis is including in its harm that its regulations cause the global harm. But the question is whether the United States or Brazil or some other country should only be considering the local harm when they do their own regulations or should they be doing global harm. And there's a huge debate in the United States about this with the Obama folks using global harm and the Trump folks saying no, it needs to be local. Okay. So that's social cost of carbon. Next topic, trade leakage and the pricing coalition. All right, what's the leakage problem? If only some countries impose a carbon price or if countries impose different carbon prices, so some low and some high, then what happens? Actors outside of the pricing region, so space only like the Western hemisphere imposes a carbon tax and the Western hemisphere and the EU or say, let's say has a carbon tax. Countries in say China, I'm sorry, actors in China or India will then maybe increase their use of energy or increase the use of fossil fuels, offsetting the emissions reductions in the pricing region. Right, that is industry might just shift offshore outside the pricing region, kind of making the carbon price futile. Right, it, it decreases kind of the effectiveness of the carbon tax. And that's known as leakage, right? That is the emissions leak out of the pricing region into other parts of the world. And it's inefficient because businesses are now locating based on carbon taxes in parts of the world that prefer not to operate in. And your carbon tax really hasn't done what it's supposed to be doing. Related to this, closely related to this is what you might think of as the coalition problem, right? That is which countries are going to have a reasonable carbon price. There's two aspects of this. One is the free rider problem, which is each country is better off if other countries bear the cost of emissions reductions and they don't. So the United States would be much better off if everyone else reduced the emissions and we could just keep on going our merry way. And that's true for every country. And so getting a large coalition has to overcome free rider problem. And on top of that, you can think of what's called the pollution haven problem, which is not only are you better off, if other countries bear the cost of emissions reductions and you don't, but you might attract industry by being a free rider. That is all the polluting industries, CO2 polluting might come into your country, right? And that's an advantage because of the, you know, the jobs and other benefits that having those local, having those industries be local bring to you. 
So there's not only an incentive not to join the coalition, I'm sorry, let me say that differently, not only kind of a free rider problem, which says you just don't really care, you just want other countries to do it, but there's an incentive to affirmatively not join the coalition to attract heavy industry. That makes achieving a global agreement on emissions extraordinarily hard to do, All right? But without a broad agreement, we really can't address the problem. Like United States, for example, is 15% of the global emissions. If the United States went to zero, it wouldn't really mean anything at all. All right. This is, I think, the central problem in carbon tax design. And fear of leakage, because other countries do not price carbon, is widely cited as an important reason not to impose our own carbon price. Right? It pushes jobs offshore, and politicians really hate that. Right. One of the reasons the United States did not ratify the Kyoto Protocol, one of the first climate change treaties, was explicitly concerns about leakage. Right. And lack of global participation may make reaching reasonable climate goals impossible. All right. So what are the problems then that we want to, how do we think about this? So the central way of thinking about addressing leakage is something called border adjustments. What's a border adjustment? So let's take the United States, suppose it has a tax on domestic emissions. A border adjustment says that if you import a good in, into the United States and there was emissions associated with the production of that good abroad, so let's say it's a piece of steel, you're importing that from South Korea into the United States. Then when you import it, you have to pay the same tax on that piece of steel as a steel produced in the United States, right? So any emissions from the production of that steel abroad get taxed when the good is imported. It's an import tariff, if you will, based on the emissions in the production of that good. Correspondingly, if a good is exported from the United States, we would rebate prior taxes paid. And the basic idea with border adjustments is it eliminates the incentive to shift production abroad because it doesn't matter where the good, good is produced, the tax will be the same. If it's produced in the United States and consumed here, it bears a tax. If it's produced in, say, South Korea and consumed here, it bears a tax. If it's produced in the United States or South Korea and consumed in another country, there's no tax because we rebate our tax when the good is exported. These are very popular. The EU has announced plans to impose border adjustments later this year. Every single carbon tax bill introduced in the United States this year includes border adjustments. Um, the problem is they're super hard to do. You really don't know how to do them accurately. You don't know what the emissions were done. Well, I'm sorry, the emissions were from the production of a good abroad. They might violate the WTO because they're seen as protectionists. And I'm going to show you in a second this graph. They're not very effective. So here's a figure I'll show you right here. Um, of a CGE model of the effects of border adjustments. So essentially all the studies of border adjustments use these very large computable general equilibrium models. They have you know, millions of line of code, they have detailed representations of the economy, they calibrate them to data, and they can kind of run simulations on the model and see what happens. And so they run simulations with and without border adjustments. And this is, I'll show you right now, the simulation I was involved with, the big CGE model we built here at Chicago. And uh, this is a carbon tax in basically the OECD. And that's the top black line. So it's global reductions. So that's the total reductions globally from what we call an Annex B tax, which is Annex B in climate change lingo is basically the OECD. And you can see the x-axis is the carbon tax in uh, dollars per ton of CO2. The y-axis is the emissions reductions relative to our estimate of the business as usual emissions. And with a carbon tax of say $50 a ton, you know, we get about 12% emissions reductions. The red dashed line, I'm sorry, the green dashed line is the emissions reductions we get if we add border adjustments. As you can see, we don't really get a big emissions reduction increase in border adjustments. There's just not a lot happening there. The bottom line, 
the kind of dotted line is the emissions reductions we would get if instead we had a global tax. And so what you can see is the importance, not so much of adding border adjustments, but of getting global participation in a climate treaty. Okay. Now, what are the law and economics questions that this issue raises? I've got four. Number one is how do we design systems that encourage global participation in the climate treaty? There's a lot of ideas floating out there that need further thinking. So one of them is put forward by Bill Nordhaus, a recent Nobel Prize winner in economics for his work on climate change. He proposed something called climate clubs. The idea is, is that groups of nations would get together and will agree to a harmonized climate, climate, I'm sorry, harmonized carbon price within that group. And they would have tariffs on all imports for people not in their club. And what he claimed was when he modeled that out was that this created incentives to join climate clubs and therefore incentives to have global participation in a climate treaty. It's possible, it's not sure we fully understand the theory on that and how well it works. Um, so there's room for other ways of thinking about it, including what kind of international institutions we can set up, what kind of side payments uh, we can arrange in order to get countries to participate. Maybe the most important problem we have in climate change. Um, border adjustments. So if we're gonna have border adjustments, how do we do that? How do we design them to prevent avoidance? So for example, can you just uh, switch your, your fuel source? So South Korea might have some hydro and some coal. If it's gonna ship steel to the United States, can it ship the steel made with hydro to the United States and the steel made with coal it keeps domestically? Then the steel it ships in the United States wouldn't have any emissions associated with it. It wouldn't bear a tariff. Right, so how do we deal with fuel switching and trans uh, shipping and other ways of avoiding the tax? We still don't know the answer to those problems. Legality of border adjustments is more of a straight legal problem than a law and economics problem, but how do we think about whether border adjustments would be consistent with international trade rules? And finally, uh, the design of systems that work better than border adjustments. If inevitably we're gonna have different carbon prices in different parts of the world, are there better systems than border adjustments to deal with the problem of leakage. I've been working on this now for, I don't know, five or six years, this latter problem. So let me show you some simulations I did on that issue. So these are um, graphs that are kind of similar to what you might remember from Economics 101 from college, where we looked at the trade-off between say beer and wine or guns and butter or some other graph. They're, um, production possibility frontiers graphs from basic economics. The x-axis is uh, change in GDP, basically it measured in consumption. So it's a cost. If you go to the left, it's how much reduction or how much cost in GDP you incur. And the y-axis is the emissions reductions you get for that cost. And what we've simulated here is a bunch of different taxes that are imposed only in the OECD. And we look at how effective they are at reducing emissions given the possibility of leakage. And what you can see looking at the left-hand panel is that different taxes have very different uh, effectiveness given leakage. Uh, so for example, the bottom blue line there in the left-hand panel is a traditional carbon tax on domestic emissions. And if you go up to that yellow line in the left-hand panel, that, that's the emissions we would get if, we switch that same tax instead to extraction rather than emissions. So rather than looking at smokestacks, we look at oil wells. You tax the oil well rather than the smokestack and you get a very, very different emissions profile because its effects on leakage are really different. And so there's room, just you can see in these graphs, for thinking about how carbon tax design interacts with leakage to do better and worse given the possibility of leakage. The right-hand panel, just to tell you what that is, is we run the same simulations, but we change the elasticity of foreign energy supply. So how much does foreign energy respond to changes in the price of energy? I'm sorry, foreign energy extraction respond to the change in the price of energy. And you can see then that the taxes look quite different. With a high elasticity of foreign energy supply, we end up with the extraction tax looking quite bad. With a low elasticity, it looks really good. And so depending on what you think the right parameters are, you might have different carbon tax design. That's kind of an example of 
the sort of work we might think of when we think about the leakage problem. All right, negative emissions. I showed you this already. Well, I didn't tell you the scale. I put a new little line in there in the bottom in the red box. Those graphs that take P3, that bottom yellow there, that is a technology they're assuming exists called BECCS, B-E-C-C-S. But that is, is bioenergy. So you grow plants, you chop the plants down, and you burn them to generate electricity. You put a device in the top of the smokestack, captures the resulting carbon dioxide, compress the carbon dioxide into liquid, and inject it on the ground. So you have bioenergy, capture the carbon, and store it, BECCS. All right, now what is the IPCC assuming for BEX? The OFLU, by the way, A-F-O-L-U, the kind of brown is deforestation. Um, okay, what is the, IR, uh, um, so the IPCC assuming about BEX? That yellow line on P3 represents an amount of BEX that is roughly planting one third of all land, all arable land, I'm sorry, on the entire planet with bioenergy crops. That's what they're talking about when they talk about negative emissions. Now, if you're laughing, if you say that's just utterly infeasible, that's just fantasy, I agree with you, it's just fantasy. But the question is, if we're gonna need some very large amount of negative emissions, how do we make that happen? Even if one third of all land planted is in fact a fantasy. All right, there's a bunch of different technologies to make that happen. There's natural climate solutions. These are forests, you know, defore preventing deforestation or replanting old forests. Um, you can um, store carbon in the soil in, through agricultural practices. So you kind of these natural things. There's mechanical storage, so you can capture the carbon and inject it on the ground, or you can combine natural and mechanical with BEX. So BEX takes a natural system, bioenergy, and then combines it with mechanical storage on the ground. Um, you can just capture carbon in the air, just put up a big filter and just capture the carbon, compress it and inject it on the ground. So different mechanical ways. And there's other things you, we have out there that are possible technologies like burying charcoal, it's called biochar, or putting a whole bunch of stones all over the place and um, uh, the stones absorb carbon dioxide. And so that's another way of doing it. Okay. What are the legal problems? Let's just take forestry and soil carbon. We have some experience with how to design systems, incentive systems for storing carbon in forests and in soil. These are known as offset systems, which are um, payments to uh, some kind of actor. It could be a private entity, or it could be a government to either plant or to not destroy a forest. And there's a bunch of these actually operating in Brazil right now. Um, the experience has not been good, right? Basically the experience is to summarize it quickly is waste, fraud and abuse. That is there's payments to keep forests outstanding. And then you go look and there's no forest there, there's a bunch of farms, right? So waste, fraud and abuse. So the question is how do we design better incentive systems for negative emissions? There's a lot of problems with doing it. It's really hard to measure. Even if you can verify that there's a forest where they're supposed to be, it's really hard to verify how much carbon is in that forest, what kind of trees are planted, how big they are, how big their roots are and so forth. Um, you may not know whether the carbon stored there is what's called additional, right? If you're paying someone not to chop down a forest, how do you know they weren't gonna chop it down anyway? Right? You might be paying them to do what they were gonna do even without the payment, which means you're just wasting your money. What if there's a forest fire? How do you deal with the fact that the carbon may not be permanently stored? What if this carbon really is stored there, but someone instead just chops down a forest next door, right? So you're just kind of switching what forests are cut down rather than actually increasing the amount of carbon or amount of forests that are there. What about if there's bad side effects? Or what if you plant a monoculture forest that destroys biodiversity? How do you deal with that? How do you deal with local corruption problems? There's an enormous number of difficult problems with the design and implementation of these incentive systems. 
And if you go back, I'm sorry to my graph here, if you believe figures like this are necessary to keep climate change at a reasonable level, we need to have you know, vast swaths of the planet planted with natural climate solutions, then you need to figure out, desperately need to figure out how to design these incentive systems. Other legal problems. Uh, something called additionality, I mentioned this already. So additionality is ensuring that any emissions reductions you're paying for are quote, additional to the emissions reductions that would have occurred anyway. If you think about this carefully, that's simply a transition rule, right? The baseline, what would have happened anyway, is what we're kind of assuming is the transition and we're only gonna pay for things on top of that. You can have all kinds of different transition rules. You could have a transition rule saying, we'll pay for any emissions on top of what's currently being stored today. Any, I'm sorry, any storage beyond what's currently being stored today or any storage beyond zero. We'll pay for current storage. But you can imagine all kinds of different transition rules, not just the additionality rule. And the question is, how, what's the optimal transition rule? How do we think about the incentives that those rules create, the measurement problems those rules create, and how do we think about what the right rule is? Almost all, maybe all, of the offsets literature or the negative emissions literature assumes that the right transition rule is the additionality rule. But as you probably know, there's enormous literature in law and economics about the law and economics of legal transitions. And all of that literature can be brought to bear on this problem of negative emissions and offsets. The second problem is certification entities. There are many entities, mostly NGOs or nonprofits, that purport to certify negative emissions. Right, so you can say if you're uh, Microsoft and you want to say we have net zero emissions, how do you prove that? You go to some company that has a beautiful website and all kinds of pretty pictures of nature and so forth on their website saying we will certify that Microsoft is in fact paid for a forest in Indonesia or something like that. And there's dozens of these entities and a legal problem is how do you regulate those entities? Because those entities may not themselves be doing very good jobs Yet Microsoft, other companies, countries are relying on these entities to certify that in fact, there's a forest where someone says there is. And so how do you regulate those entities is an important legal problem for law and economics scholars. All right, I'm gonna keep on going. I'm gonna keep on going here, climate finance. What are the problems here? There's multiple problems with climate finance. I've listed three of them. I'll show you some pictures about them in one second. Um, one is how do we pay for mitigation and ad adaptation activities, right? So if you're say a wealthy country like the United States and you wanna, or you've agreed to finance emissions reductions in a less wealthy country, how do you make that happen? Like what are the financing mechanisms? There's all kinds of legal issues in financing that have to be addressed. The second one is that the financial system, banks and other entities that operate in the financial system might be subject to risk because of climate change. And how do we ensure financial system resilience in the face of climate change? And the third one is how do we design disclosures by firms on their climate risk. So I'll show you three pictures, one on each. This is a little fuzzy, I'm sorry. I grabbed it from the web, so you probably can't read it. Um, sometimes web capture is not so great. Um, this is just a picture of climate finance mechanisms. So money flowing on the left-hand side from different types of entities to all the way to the right-hand side to spending on mitigation or adaptation activities. And you know, I know you can't read it, that's too small, but you can see the kind of the complexity of the problem. And each one of these steps has legal issues associated with it. How do you design the debt instruments or the financing instruments and so forth? How do you design insurance products and other things like that? This is from um, the Board of Governors of the United States Federal Reserve, currently on their website. And this is a web page they have devoted to, um, how they're thinking about 
the impacts of climate change on the stability of the finance system. Right, so on the left-hand side there, the green is examples of climate-related risks. And then um, the very, very right-hand side, the black, is the vulnerabilities that the finance system may face because of those risks. And the Fed is actively soliciting comments on how to think about limiting the vulnerabilities, the right-hand column, in the finance system because of the climate risks, the left-hand column. Right, so how do we think about bank regulation for example, in light of climate change. And it's a kind of an active topic right now being discussed by the Fed. Here's a screenshot from the United States Securities and Exchange Commission soliciting comments on what kind of climate disclosures companies should have to make. Right, that is if you're, again, Microsoft. Microsoft has large emissions profile because they run servers. Right, servers are very, very energy intensive. So tech companies tend to be emissions intensive. And the question then is what kind of disclosures should that company make to the public so we know about what its climate, what its climate activities are. Right, so all of these things are standard problems in law and economics just applied to climate change. So for example, on the last one, the SEC, we have to think about corporate finance and securities laws and what the purpose is of securities laws are, why we have disclosure to think about what kind of design of disclosure systems we wanna have because of climate change. All right, I have one last problem I wanna talk about, which is ethics. And then I'll stop and take questions. Okay, there are enormous number of ethical, legal, economic problems associated with climate change. Uh, they're distributed problems. So for example, emissions, come mostly from developed countries or China and India. I'll show you a picture of that in one second. The harms may be concentrated in poorer countries, right? But regardless of whether it's rich versus poor, you have unequal emissions profiles, unequal exposure to harm. And the question is, how do we think about the distributive problems? One group of actors, one country, one group of people are harming other people. And the question is, how do we think about the ethical considerations and how do they interact with the legal and economic considerations in designing climate policy? Second issue, buyers versus sellers, right? So in the United States, on the left, in the United States, it's very common to say oil companies are to blame for climate change, right? We are supposed to hate Exxon. They're the bad guys, right? But then what happens? We get in a car and drive to work. Right, and we're using Exxon's gasoline when we drive to work, right? So they're selling us this product, we're buying this product and between Exxon and us, someone is causing those emissions from driving to work. And the question is whether it's the seller, Exxon, to blame, are they the bad guys? Or the buyer, us, the drivers, are we the bad guys? And so this question of how you allocate blame between buyers and sellers, again, is a standard problem in law and economics, one that Ronald Coase dealt with 50 or more, 60 years ago, right? How do we think about blame? And Coase says, maybe blame isn't the right way to think about that. There's just a, a transaction. But either way, how do we deal with that problem in, in climate change? And then another ethical issue I mentioned already, the distant future, I'm gonna skip that because I've talked about it already. Um, let me show you some data. Oops, sorry. This is current emissions. And what you can see is that China is the dominant emitter and Asia overall is dominant. Right? You can see Asia is more than half of global emissions right now. Uh, North America, so that's mostly the United States, excuse me, it's about 15% of global emissions, 18%, sorry, Europe is 17%. And you can see way down there on the bottom, the blue, that's South America. But though I should note that this figure does not include deforestation. This is only fossil fuels. So if we included deforestation, South America would look a lot bigger. Now, that's just current. What about past? So this is the cumulative emissions rather than just current emissions. Now you can see that Asia, the EU, and North America are all roughly equal contributors cumulatively with the United States being the largest single cumulative emitter. So if you think that's what matters, then the United States is the kind of bad guy, if you will, the one that's emitted the most. 
break it down in a different way. Oops, sorry. One more time. This breaks it down on a per capita basis. So if you look at the top graph, what that is is per capita emissions by income group. It's so on the left-hand side, you can see high income groups are the ones that emit the most on a per capita basis. Low income groups by far the less on a least on a per capita basis. And that's consistent with emissions going up with um, energy use and energy use going up with wealth. On the bottom line there, we break it down by country. What you can see is the blue, that's still the United States and North America, is by far the highest per capita emissions. Right? The red, that's Asia, now looks pretty good. They're very low per capita emissions. They have a lot of emissions because they have a lot of people, but on a per capita basis, they're relatively low. All right, so what are some questions here? Um, should the obligations to mitigate or to pay for adaptation be keyed to current emissions or to past emissions? Or should they not be? Is climate treaty just a bargain? We just get together at a bargaining table and figure out who's gonna do what? Or must that bargain be ethically informed? If it's ethically informed, if we're gonna say we're going to decide who bears the obligation to reduce emissions based on past bad behavior, then we are necessarily, or almost necessarily, choosing a set of emissions reductions that are more expensive than we, if we choose the most economically, co least costly set of emissions reductions, right? So the question is how much should we, cost should we be willing to bear to uh, uh, reduce emissions or to do it in an ethical way? Here's the Framework Convention on Climate Change from 1992. Note this language here. The largest share of historical and current global emissions of greenhouse gases has originated in developed countries. The per capita emissions in developing countries are relatively low. And the share of, emiss of global emissions originating in developing countries will grow to meet their social and developmental need, development needs. Right? That is the Framework Convention itself embeds within it this ethical consideration. Here it is again on the acknowledging paragraph, the global nature of climate change calls for the widest possible cooperation by all countries and their participation in an effective and appropriate international response. And here's the key phrase, in accordance with their common but differentiated responsibilities. The idea being there that ethics plays a role in who reduces emissions. All right. One last thing, and then I want to stop. This is very relevant for Brazil. Suppose a country has a really big carbon sink within its territory, like just for example, the Amazon. The question is who owns that sink? So can that country destroy the sink if it wants to, harming the rest of the world when it does that? And if it doesn't destroy the sink, it's, it's, it, it owns it. So if it chooses not to, maybe it can demand to be paid not to reduce the sink, right? Or is that sink, the Amazon forest, a common resource of mankind or humankind? And the country it has no right to destroy that sink because when it does that, it hurts other people. And therefore, if it destroys the sink, it should have to pay, right? I don't know what the right answer is to that. It strikes me as a kind of complicated ethical problem, but a very, very important one in terms of how we think about the massive carbon sinks we see around the world, right? And if it, if it, the Amazon forest is kind of owned by Brazil and it can destroy it if it wants and therefore hurt other people, what's the difference between that and the oil on the ground that Saudi Arabia owns? Is it allowed to pump it out and burn it? Is that any different than, than Brazil destroying the Amazon? Both cases, they're hurting other people using a natural resource that's within their territory. If you think the soil, the oil on the ground, Saudi Arabia is different than the Amazon, then the question is why? It's not really clear to me that they're different, but maybe they are. Um, okay, so I'm gonna stop there. I will have this conclusion, which is work on climate change, right? It is one of the most important problems in the world. Uh, and you as an academic should be working on important problems. That's why we're here. That's, 
uh, it's a privilege to be an academic and you should use that privilege to work on really important things. Climate change is one of those. There are just overwhelming number of issues to study. Uh, important issues, issues where a lot of economic scholars can bring a lot of knowledge to bear. So my conclusion is work on climate change. Thanks very much. Thank you, David. Thanks a lot for, for your lecture. Uh, well, I have one. I just received one question from uh, Haisa Mosti. Uh, difficult one. Uh, since climate change is a general pro problem, how can global solutions be compatible in a scenario so different among nations? This is, I think this is the main challenge. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know the answer. Uh, um, you know, each nation has its own um, profile in terms of, of what its emissions look like and what its development uh, looks like. And so the way that we, the United States and most of the countries approach this in the Paris Agreement was to try and get global participation, get everyone on board with doing something, but let each country kind of decide what it was gonna do for itself and use kind of peer pressure to get countries to do more. So each country, the one thing countries had to do was publicly announce what they were gonna do. They had to put forth what's called uh, nationally determined contributions or NDCs and say, this is what we're going to do. And every country that's in the Paris Agreement, which is I think every country in the world or about one or two, has a publicly announced NDC. And the idea is that when you have to say publicly, this is what we're doing, it puts a pressure on you to do something pretty reasonable, particularly if other countries are also doing something reasonable. That was the approach taken in Paris. Uh, some problems with it. If you look at the, if you add up all the NDCs, and say, what emissions reductions do we get with that compared to what trajectory we actually need? It turns out they didn't add up to a whole lot. They don't get us where we need to go. But maybe you know, the next round of NDCs every five years, you're supposed to update it, um, will be more aggressive. Um, so maybe the Paris approach will turn out to be okay. Um, the other problem is, is that since every country is doing something different, you have leakage problems, right? So if some countries aren't really doing very much, for example, India just said, we're not going to reduce emissions. They're just going to reduce the energy intensity of their economy rather than actually reduce their total emissions. They're not really doing a lot at all then. Um, then you generate leakage problems. And so you haven't really solved one of the central problems uh, with regional carbon prices when you use the Paris approach. And the question is, is there something better? Uh, Nordhaus proposes climate clubs, just put big tariffs on countries that are behaving in ways we don't like. Maybe that works, but uh, yeah, I think the, the question there is one of the questions I pose is one of the most important research problems. Um, we don't know the answer to, to kind of how we dynamically deal with this free rider problem. I see another and question. Yeah, yeah do, do you have any, any thoughts on, on the European Union green package that you just passed it now in July. But there, there are some carbon tax borders issues on that. And yeah, so they're putting, they're proposing something called CBAM, C B A M, or Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, which is basically a tariff at the border for imports of uh, certain carbon intensive goods like steel and aluminum and other things like that to kind of project their. Um, their uh, local industry. So again, I'll show you, I'll go back. You know, this is not just the EU, but oh, where'd it go? This was our estimates, I don't know, it's about 10 years ago now. We could update them, but I think nothing, not much has changed. Uh, a carbon tax in the OECD, so not just the EU, but a, a broader coalition, including the United States, for example, and the top black line is what we were projecting uh, for emissions reductions with that carbon tax. I think it'd be a little steeper now because uh, solar and wind are cheaper now than they were 10 years ago. Um, but you know, it wouldn't be that much different. And then the green line is just kind of what we get with uh, border adjustments. They're just not doing a lot in terms of increasing um, 
emissions reductions. They may be protecting domestic industry and it may be valuable in terms of the domestic politics of a carbon tax and the domestic politics are first order important in getting things passed, but they're not doing a lot for emissions, right? So I don't view border taxes as a kind of primarily a, an emissions reductions policy. I view border taxes or border adjustments as ways to keep domestic industries from complaining and therefore blocking the enactment of reasonable carbon policies. They're just payoffs, if you will. And my view is whatever you need to do to pay off blocking industries, you should be doing. So if it's a border adjustment, if that's what you got to do, you should do it. But you should keep in mind, it's number one, not doing a lot for emissions. And number two, may really piss off other countries and therefore cause all kinds of other problems. And maybe it's not the best way to pay off industries. Maybe there's other ways. But that's kind of what I view it as. It's not really an effective emissions reduction measure. It's instead a way of buying off industries. If you go, I'll go back, go down a couple more slides. This is this, our simulations of different policies. So the, I'll walk you through this in a little bit more detail. The blue line is your standard carbon tax. You look at the left-hand panel. The lines immediately above it, the kind of green and whatever that is, kind of red line, uh, those are the same tax, the, the production, the standard carbon tax, we call it a production tax with border adjustments. So you see in this simulation, we're getting a little bit more emissions reductions for given cost and we add border adjustments. But in that left-hand panel, we're not coming anywhere close to the emissions reductions we could get if we adopt an entirely different policy, which is taxing domestic extraction. So there, there are other policies that work better in terms of emissions reductions than border adjustments. The line above the yellow line, by the way, the kind of purplish lines at the very top there, those are comp more complex combinations of taxes. So those, those are combinations of taxes on domestic extraction and domestic production. So they combine a, a standard or generic carbon tax with a tax on extraction. So if you want to say have a hundred dollar tax on carbon dioxide emissions, you might have 40 of it on extraction and 60 on production or something like that. They're kind of complex combinations of taxes and you can do even better in those cases, and if you kind of move over to the right-hand panel, those combinations are less sensitive to foreign elasticity of energy supply. So they're more robust solutions as well. So I think there are other ways the EU should be thinking about this problem other than border adjustments. But the advantage border adjustments have, I think, is domestic politics, right? And that, that uh, you know, as a law and economic scholar, I don't know that much about domestic politics, but they're really important because if you can't pass the thing, it doesn't matter how beautiful it is in a graph. Perfect. Uh, we have another question from Maria Eugenia. Uh, thinking about carbon taxes or BAs, how to deal with the problem of the production of products happening somewhere, for example, India or China, and the consumption happening elsewhere, the US or European Union? How can this issue be regulated in multilateral or plurilateral agreements in a way that does not use the Paris approach? Yeah, so that's precisely what we're trying to address here. So what we've done is kind of assume that the OECD in this, in this simulation is imposing a carbon tax and no one else in the world is doing anything. So everyone else in the world is just operating in a competitive equilibrium. So just a regular economy with no carbon tax. And then it's got the models got trade in it. So industries move abroad in this model, right? That's what we're trying to figure out here. And what we can see is that there are other ways of dealing with this other than border adjustments that may, may work better. So that's precisely the question we were addressing here, but I don't have it to show you. We run the same simulation when we say, okay, what's the benefit of increasing the coalition size? So we can run, take any one of these taxes and say, what does it look like if it's just the EU or the EU and the United States or the EU, United States and China and so forth. And there you get enormous benefits from increasing coalition size. That is these solutions that is doing better for a given coalition are swamped by how much better you can do if you increase coalition size. That is the first order of business. It's kind of getting everyone on board. If you can't do that, then these solutions kind of work as second best solutions, if you will. Uh, 
just one last question uh, from Eduardo Parente. Uh, can less developed countries grow without relying on fossil fuels? Would it be difficult to them to stop emission after years of fossil fuel exploitation by a rich nation? I think this is some, uh, something that uh, really uh, concerns the, the, the nations in the European Union that are not so developed. And, and so the European Union are establishing a kind of fund to, to help uh, not the so developed countries there to kind of help this, this, this changing. Yeah, this, this is a terrible problem. Um, and, and here's the, let me make it even sharper, which is you put in a coal plant, I suppose you're in a lesser develop, a developing country and you, you want energy. And as we saw, we'll go back a few slides here. You wanna, you're, you know, on the bottom left, you wanna be in the top right. And you have every right to be in the top right. And everyone should want you to be in the top right. And if you're in the top right, you're going to need a lot of energy. There's just no way to do it without energy. And the cheapest sources of energy, most reliable sources of energy are fossil fuels. Now, to make it even sharper, you put in a coal plant because you believe you should be in the top right and have every right to be in the top right. And we should all want you to be there. That coal plant is going to last 50 to 75 years you're locking in those emissions for the next generation or two. And so the question is, is there a way to get countries to move up that graph without locking in those emissions? And I, I don't know the answer, but we're maybe getting to the point, just I think through lock and through good investment where wind, solar, and other renewables are now cheaper than coal. And as cheaper, cheaper than natural gas. And so it might be, we might finally, with the next five or 10 years, have it, an answer to that question, which is, yes, you can do it without fossil fuels. 10 years ago, the answer would have been, no, there's no way to do it without fossil fuels. It's, we're just kind of stuck. And one reason for optimism now is that we might be getting to the point where that's possible without distributed solar, for example. Um, the key problem is storage. And even that now is we're getting some solutions to that. Um, but it might be the really the answer to one of the key problems in climate change that is you know, posed by this question is, yes, we can think about development without fossil fuels. But if we can't, then it, we're just kind of stuck, I think. Well, David, thank you so okay. much. Yeah. Uh, Rodrigo, yeah. I would like to please. make a question, if please, you please. don't mind. Please, David. Uh, sure. I know that's a this is a very sensitive issue. Yes, I'm a, <laughs> I, I think we agree about that. And that I have a very simple question. Yeah. There have uh, um, always been climate changes on the planet Earth. This is a platitude, you know. Yeah. But uh, I would like to know how much is known for certain about the influence of the human action on these changes, you know, because to say climate change, of course, is a, is a reality, but uh, my concern, as this is a very sensitive issue, if uh, we now have the knowledge about the, uh, uh, the human action in the climate changes. This yeah. is for me is very important in order to make this discussion more uh, you know, uh, rational and not so political, because you know that this is a very political issue also. Yeah. So let me tell you how I think about, let me tell you how I think about that question, because I'm a lawyer, not a scientist. Uh, I don't know if there's any scientists uh, listening. Um, if you're all lawyers or economists, uh, none of us are really experts in that science. And so the question is, um, how do we think about that information? Now, the IPCC report from um, early this month did say it's unequivocal, but let's suppose that, you know, we just, we just don't know and, you know, it, it, it's complicated and when they say it's unequivocal, it's all model driven and the models have 10 million lines of code and we just don't, we just don't really know. And the question is how should, how should we as lawyers 
think about that problem when we're, we don't really know. And my take on it is, you know, let's suppose that they're wrong, the scientists are wrong. And the question is, what are the consequences if we spend, you know, one, two, three percent of GDP converting our economy to non fossil fuels? And then let's suppose they're right and we fail to do that. And we just kind of weigh those two scenarios and say, well, this. I don't think it's 50-50, but suppose it's just 50-50 that they're wrong. And we say, okay, what are the consequences if we reduce emissions and they're wrong, we've spent some money switching the wind and solar and batteries and so forth. We have electric cars instead of gas cars and the economy looks kind of different. We spent, we wasted money, but kind of things go on. And then the alternative scenario is if they're right and we didn't listen to them, and then we're looking at three, four, five, six degrees of temperature change with global climate. And if we say, oh, it's 50-50, which one would you, what would you do? I, I think the answer is you'd, you'd behave as if they're surely right, right? Because you wanna, you wanna minimize that just horrible risk. That is the risk on those two 50-50 bets, the coin flip. Again, I don't think it's a coin flip, but if it were, the risks on each side of that are completely different, right? One side of it's a few percentage of GDP every year for you know, the next several decades. And the other side is global climate. And so if you really uncertain or you don't trust this science, you don't understand the science, and I'm, I'm a lawyer, so I, I don't really understand the science fully, I still think you'd, you'd behave in exactly the same way. And that's, that's how I kind of think about the problem, which is it, it doesn't really matter that much that I don't know for sure, they don't understand the science, right? What I do think is that the scientists are telling us there's certainly a, a serious risk, even if it's not truly unequivocal, a serious risk of global calamity that we need to take into account. But that's, that's how I think about the problem. Well, David, um, I would like to thank you again. I would like to give the word to Maria Lucia to her final words too. It was a pleasure to have you here. Uh, truly an honor to start this second forum with such a great uh, lecture. Uh, we hope to have you here at FGV personally and in other occasions too. So many thanks again. And please, Maria Lucia, your final words and Dave D okay. as well. Thank you so much, David. It was a pleasure to hear you. It's a very important uh, issue. Uh, we totally agree about that. Okay, no doubt. And uh, I would like to invite all of our, our audience to, to, to be with us again this Thursday. We will continue to discuss this issue. And thank you so much, David, and have a, a, a wonderful final summer, you know? Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.